Good morning, everybody. Wishing you all a happy Palm Sunday. This is our third week apart, and I continue to miss all of you, but this is the, the way that God has provided for us to continue to congregate and continue to learn His Word. So I pray that you'll just continue to uh, stay in your Bibles and keep us keep one another in your prayers. So this morning I want us to look at some scripture in the book of Mark, and we're going to be talking about Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. So we're going to be in Mark 11. We're going to look at the first 11 verses. So Mark 11, 1, it says, As they approached Jerusalem, and they came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went, and they found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and they threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And Jesus entered Jerusalem, and he went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So Jesus came to Jerusalem, and he came here to conquer, but not in the way that a lot of the Jewish people there thought. He came there to conquer sin, to heal them, to give them what they really needed. A lot of people there that day, they were talking about the kingdom of David, and they were talking about the restoration of, of what Jerusalem was like, what Israel was like when David was king. Because David was a very popular king. He was cool. He killed Goliath, of course. He slayed all these uh, Philistines, all the enemies of Israel. And, and as he would defeat another army after army after army, he became legendary. But he was not the greatest king that Israel ever had. I would contend that perhaps Solomon was. Because Solomon, he ensured a time of peace and building and economic stability. And also, most importantly, an incredible commitment to God. So, for some reason though, the people were stuck on David. They wanted that kingdom of David. They wanted that done. They wanted things to be like that. So when Jesus is coming, they have it in their minds. You know, we want things to be like they were. I want these Romans thrown out of my town. I don't want Caesar telling me how I can worship. I don't want Caesar telling me where I can go and when I can go here and when I can't go there. I don't want Caesar taking all my tax money from me. And so they get it in their minds that this was the source of their problems. Caesar was their problem. And if they could be delivered from Caesar, all their problems would be fixed. But you know, Jesus understood because he said, you have a bigger problem than the Romans. You see, the Romans will be here while you're alive. And when your body gives out, well, the Romans have nothing to worry, nothing to worry you anymore. But in actuality, you have a whole lot more to worry about. Your eternal soul. And he was there to deliver them from the, from the curse of sin. He was going to give his life that they could live eternally in heaven. And not just that, but that they would spend their rest of their time here on earth with the Holy Spirit living within them. That they would have a direct relationship with God. Something that up until now went through the priests and the temple and the sacrifices and all of that mess. So when Jesus came riding in, he was more signifying what Solomon did. As Solomon rode in on a colt, as uh, 
as described in 1 Kings and as predicted by the prophet Zechariah, that Solomon, uh, that the Messiah would, as Solomon did, come riding in as a king of peace. I heard the story about a young man, a little boy, his name was Will. Actually, his name was William because his father's name was William, his grandfather's name was William, and his great-grandfather before him was also named William. And so they dallied out the names, if you will. The great-grandfather was William. The father, or the grandfather was Bill. The, the father was Billy. So they had pretty much ran out of him. The only thing left was Will. So they called him Will. And his dad wanted to do something nice with him. His dad wanted to take him to a Civil War reenactment. So they go out in uh, Gettysburg on July 4th weekend, and it was a huge spectacle. Thousands of people there. And all the reenactors. Well, the little boy was not happy about the noise. The cannons were very loud. The muskets, the all the rifle shots. <clears throat> and it made him very uncomfortable. And soon the volleys of cannons had had died down a little bit, so he relaxed. And had just really started to relax and enjoy himself. And the Confederate general steps up to the front of the line. And he looks down the line at all his cannons. And he barks out the order, Fire at will! The little boy was unconsolable from then on in. I guess I need some kind of a laugh track or something to know if anybody thought that was funny, but please email me or Facebook message me that you thought it was funny if you did. I just need to know. <laughs> well, the reason I bring that up is what Jesus was showing was a reenactment as well. Because what he was giving everybody was, I'm coming as Solomon came. I'm coming as a king of peace. I'm coming here to show you that this fighting with one another, this living your lives in this in this way, in this manner, it's, it's not going to work for you. It's going to bring about an end that you don't want. And so what we find here is Jesus coming in, and as God always is, he's smarter than you and I. He's not giving us what we want. He's giving us what we need. I know everybody's life has been turned upside down with this COVID-19 thing. And we're trying to stay safe. You know, we've been blessed as a church. I don't know of anyone within our church that has a positive case of this. I don't know anyone who has um, who has been very sick or anything like that with uh, definitely nothing that involves this coronavirus. But what we have found is a lot of us are very inconvenienced. Yeah, we don't have a lot of problems. We as a society tend to have inconveniences. A lot of our friends, a lot of people that we know, people around us, they've come up with this idea that I need to hoard into my home. I need to pack my house full of canned goods. I need to pack my house full of toilet paper. I need to buy all the antiseptics I can possibly buy. I think what people are trying to do is they feel that they are in a very uncontrollable situation. It makes them uncomfortable. So what they're looking to do at this point is control something. So they're filling their living room with cases of Charmin. I talk to people that work at the grocery stores and they say it's the same people every morning. They get there as soon as the doors open and they rush back and they put the limit of toilet paper in their cart and milk and bread and all of these things. And they do it every day. I mean, at some point they have to run out of room to store it, but yet, you know, that's maybe to some people it's their hobby. It gives them something to do. But I think for the most part, it gives these folks a, a feeling of control. That in a very uncertain time, they found something that they can do, that they can, that they can fix. But what have they really fixed? I mean, what good does it do you? Just because you glance into your living room and you see stacks and stacks of supplies, 
that's not going to keep you from catching COVID-19. That's not going to help you recover from COVID-19. You're going to have more than you ever possibly going to need or use. But it's a false sense of security, but it's still a sense of security. Because people think, well, I've done this now. I have this. And, and, and by having this, uh, all these supplies now in my home, now suddenly I'm in control again. I'm fixing this. How do we do that with our lives? You see, with our very souls. When Jesus says to you, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What he's telling us is, I'm the only thing that can fix your problems. By one man, sin came into the world. And when sin came into the world, so did death. So did disease. A lot of folks say, well, looks like COVID-19 started in China. And well, it probably did. But we had problems before we had COVID-19. And those problems existed way back to the Garden of Eden. When God created man, there was no there was no disease, there was no illness, there was no sickness. There were no germs, there were no, at least not unhealthy germs. <clears throat> and the creation was spoiled. It was broken. So we have community. We have one another to help us get through these tough times. People are going to struggle and have struggled since the since the fall of man in the garden. And throughout this struggle, one of the things that we have is one another. Yes, of course, we're tied together by these Christian bonds of love. The old, the old hymn, Blessed Be the Ties That Bind Our Hearts in Christian Love. We care about one another, just as Christ cared about us. As God loved us, so we do love one another. And we will have opportunities to take care of each other. I know in my last sermon I talked about being the light of the world, about letting the love of Christ shine through you, of taking the, the gifts that God has given you and using them to help one another. Sometimes it might be physical. Maybe you have something that someone needs and you can spare it and you share with them. That's lovely. It's wonderful. But for the most part, it's going to be emotional or spiritual calling someone, messaging them, somehow or another reaching out to them, letting them know that they're not alone, letting them know that you care for them as God cares for them, addressing their need. You see, when Jesus came riding into Jerusalem that day, what he was telling his people was, you have needs greater than you even know. You think that getting rid of the Romans would solve your problems, but all that would do would be to change the source of your of your antagonistic uh, natures instead of something there will be something else to bother you when we fix one problem we just create another and that's uh, one of the symptoms of you know, fallen human nature so yeah we're struggling right now we're struggling with change we're struggling with having to do things in a way that we've never had to do them before but God hasn't changed in your relationship with God, if it changes, what I implore you to do is let it get deeper. You have time to study your Bibles. You have time to pray. You have time to reflect on your relationship with God. Today we would normally celebrate with communion. And, of course, we can't do that together. But I do ask you to think, as we do every Communion Sunday, and I try to remind you that the entire ceremony of Communion is to remind us how badly we need God. How urgently we need a relationship with God. That as we drink of the cup and as we eat of the bread, we need God as badly as we need food and water. That when we feel those hunger pains in our stomachs, when we feel that parched throat and we want that 
drink. We are to be reminded that as we need that for our physical bodies, we desperately need a relationship with God for our spiritual souls. Friends, I miss you guys. I mean, I love being up here in the woods and I love getting away from the from the uh, the craziness of town. And don't get me wrong, oh, Lord, I certainly enjoy the Laurel Mountains. But I would much rather be at Calvary with you guys today. I'd much rather be able to shake your hands and to hug you. But that's not what God has in mind for us right now. And as we read in the book of Esther, for a time like this. Well, this is a time like I've never seen in my life. And I imagine none of you either have. But God has prepared us for this, even though we didn't realize it or maybe we don't see it. He's prepared us for this. Remind one another today, and that definitely if you get an opportunity to remind someone who doesn't know Christ, what Palm Sunday really was about. It was about Jesus coming in to fix a problem that we didn't know we had. I think one of the most comforting things that I've ever read, other than scripture, of course, but someone had posted it online, was that God's plans for my life has already factored in my stupidity. That as God knows our limitations. He knows if you're the brightest bulb in the light rack or not. He knows that we're going to disappoint. We'll disappoint ourselves, we'll disappoint our friends and our families, and we'll disappoint him. But he loves us. And his love for us is not conditional upon what we can do for him. So guys, we will be together again, and I hope sooner than later. We don't know when that's going to be. But until we are, I implore you, draw close to each other, love your families with a uh, ferocity that you haven't loved before. Forgive. Find a way to make a difference in someone's life. And be reassured that God loves you. And as he has brought you through so many other things in your life, he will bring all of us through this. I love you guys. I miss you. I can't wait until I can see you again. Have a great rest of your Palm Sunday. Goodbye.